أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم dear viewers and welcome to the show on Imam Hussein TV where we are analyzing various aspects of the life and legacy of Fatima Zahra عليه السلام on the occasion of her martyrdom inshallah in today's episode we'll be looking at the injustices faced by Fatima Zahra عليه السلام not only in her life but far after her death and we are referring to of course the legacy that she left behind uh, and the fact that unfortunately it is uh, not very apparent uh, to circles outside uh, of Shia Muslims uh, both in the non-Shia community and also in the non-Muslim community. Inshallah to help me tackle this topic I'm joined by Sheikh Muhammad Al-Hali. Assalamu alaikum Sheikh. Wa Thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you. It's my honor. So when we speak about the injustice uh, against Fatima in terms of uh, how much her, her, her legacy uh, is apparent in the eyes of, of, of non-Shia circles. What do we, what do we mean? What, what are we referring to exactly? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. One of the titles of uh, the Holy Lady, Fatima al-Zahra, peace and blessings be upon her, is al-maghsubat haqquha, the one whose rights were usurped from her. Of course, some of the viewers, respected brothers and sisters, others may be familiar with the life of this holy lady and how she was treated while she was alive. Mm. In that not only her house was attacked and of course she was severely injured and her unborn child was miscarried and her house was burnt but also her right were taken away, the land of Fadak, but also her husband's legitimate divine right of Khilafah was also uh, stolen. Now, that is injustice on a very huge scale, um, and, and it really breaks the heart when you remember the Masaib and the calamities that this holy lady went through, to the extent that, of course, when she was sitting next to the blessed grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, her uh, father, she would weep and cry and, and, and talk about what happened. And of course, she would say this famous line, Subbat alayya masaib, annaha subbat ala al-ayyam sarna layaliya, that the darkness of the hardship and the tragedies is so severe that they would turn daylight into night. Mm. Um, so that uncertainty, uh, something that needs to be constantly described and discussed and not necessarily put aside or ignored. However, there is another form of oppression and injustice that this great lady experienced and is continuously going through mm. today. And that is what happened after she left this world, mm. after her martyrdom. And that is in specific terms, the narrations that talk about her life, that talk about what happened to her, that describe her characteristics. You see, um, Bani Umayya and Bani Abbas worked tirelessly to defame, to distort, to damage the reputation of the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum as -salam. I could not tell you of one individual from the 14 Ma'sumin who survived this. In essence, Every single person today, if we talk about Sayyida Fatima or Amir al muminin or Rasulullah or Imam al Sadiq or Imam al Kazim or Imam al Jawad or Imam al Askari, every single one was the recipient of character assassination. Character mm. assassination after he left this world. Mm. And that is something that a lot of money was spent. A lot of people were purchased in that sense to write and fabricate and distort and to spread these things. Because remember, these people are the greatest threat to shaitan and his uh, devilish uh, plans on this earth. So what better way? And that is to go and tell people, look, they did this way, they did that way. Mm. But another reason why the Ahl al-Bayt, such as Sayyidina Fatima, were attacked in such a manner after they left this world is to say, look, we're not as bad because mm. these people did this, this kind of thing. Mm. So when you bring down the level of certain individuals and when you are so low yourself as Bani Umayyad, Bani Abbas were, you kind of can then say, well, they're not as much better than us. They're mm. like similar to us in that sense. Mm. Uh, and so you can see that they, they, they invested a lot in this. Sayyidina Fatima Ali Salam's legacy, as far as the school of Ahl al-Bayt is concerned, is very clear. Uh, our remembrance of her, 
our commemoration of her martyrdom, our celebration of her birth, but also the understanding of you know the short period of time she lived in this world and what she set out to achieve is a bright, very empowering, very illuminating legacy. Mm. But unfortunately, the moment we look outside the school of Ahl al-Bayt, many will be shocked. Mm. And in this episode, I would like people's patience because some of the what I will mention may be unfortunately inappropriate mm. in the sense that it is more of an academic discussion. Mm. I will quote certain individuals because there is one thing talking about it emotionally. There's one thing saying, yeah, these people talk this way and that way. People will say, okay, give me demonstrations. Where can we find mm. these kind of references that are there mm. depicting Sayyidina Fatima in such a horrible way? Mm. Um, and uh, how do we deal with them? So we, we need to understand the wider conversation. We definitely need to, and we need to present it in a scientific, academic manner, so that people can see that see that look, such texts actually exist. Mm. I think it's very interesting um, this whole uh, topic generally because in our communities we're very well aware uh, of this great lady, and she's such a big part of her life. But I feel like the minute we step out of our communities very slightly, people at the very least haven't even heard of her. Uh, and I think that perhaps sometimes, I think maybe, maybe that's a discussion we can have at the end, uh, how much uh, we as a Shia of Fatima have done in trying to spread the legacy of Fatima Zahra al to uh, the wider public. Um, so I think just beginning off firstly, looking at uh, the non-Muslim academic community. I know you mentioned that you had um, some sources of, of what uh, academics have said uh, mm -hmm. about Fatima. Do you want to uh, get into that and just uh, present yes, what you have? Yes, yes. There are some Orientalists and um, scholars who looked into the religion of Islam in the past, they perhaps were inspired by literature that were non-Shia, mm. perhaps, which is likely that they were, but their depiction of individuals like Sayyidah Fatima a.s. leaves a lot to be desired. In fact, it's quite uh, insulting and mm. offensive. Let me quote to you this particular individual by the name of Father uh, Henri Lamans. Uh, uh, he died in 1912, so in the 20th century. Uh, he uh, has a book in French in which he talks about Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam. Um, it's, um, it's regarding her life. He says, a, you know, he understands a thoroughly gloomy portrait of the daughter of the Prophet. He describes her, Fatima, become, becomes a woman devoid of attraction of mediocre intelligence, completely insignificant, little esteemed by her father, ill-treated by her husband, often ill, prone to tears, who died perhaps of consumption. Mm. So when I read this passage, I can think that there isn't anything left insulting that he hasn't mentioned. Mm from the physical appearance to psychological description mm -hmm. and so on. Here we have an individual who is a scholar trying to discuss uh, this particular uh, in, uh, holy lady and describing her in such a manner, um, which of course, for some of us, when they look at this, they might immediately feel a great sense of hurt. Mm. For us, the followers and the lovers of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, she means much more than our parents, our spouse, our children, 100% much more than ourselves. Mm. So she's greater in our eyes than we are to ourselves. Mm. And so when we hear such a description or read such description mm. in literature that exists out there in academic mm. circles, of course, it does hurt. But one thing that we have to realize is this is not only Sayyidah Fatima. There are similar descriptions regarding the Holy Prophet mm. وسلم, or for example Imam Ali السلام, mm. that is found in literature. Mm. And what is interesting is, I mean, I was very much delighted with the work of uh, Father Christopher Clohisi, mm. who has a wonderful book by the name of Fatima. It's mm. very academic. But of course, as a non-Muslim, he has to bring these references mm. and he has to look at non-Shia references as well. Mm. So because he has to look at it overall. He has included descriptions, not this one in particular, but for example, as we will describe 
uh, the the relationship between Sayyid Fatima and Imam Ali alayhi salam that is unfortunately depicted in such a negative manner mm. in uh, uh, literature of our brothers the Ahl Sunnah, mm. and so he's included passages, quite a few mm. passages that show this marriage was full of arguments, mm. full of disputes, full of disagreements, and sometimes even hatred between mm. Sayyid Fatima and Imam alayhi salam, mm. something which we completely reject. Let's lest someone cuts this uh, and puts it on YouTube. Mm. Um, There's something that we completely uh, unacceptable. However, um, we need to analyze it and provide evidence why we don't accept it. Mm. I mean, what I'm really interested in is what led um, this uh, scholar to. to, to um, I, I don't know if we, we know the reason as to, as to why he sought to to ca almost character assassinate uh, Lady Fatima. Because you know, I, I think it's one thing to. Uh, to academically uh, criticize someone, but here he just seems like he's speaking out of pure insult and hatred. I mean, do we know why, uh, what his context was for this or what the reasoning was? Of course, when you read the life of this particular individual, on Henri Lamans and others, I think you realize that some of these Orientalists had a broader objective, and that is to demonize Islam mm -hmm. and Muslims and to portray as negative as an mm. image as possible mm. regarding uh, the holy figures and personalities mm -hmm. that are associated with the religion. Um, they had certain missions out there to establish and to distance people away uh, from the religion of Islam, and some of them perhaps were paid to do so. Mm. Uh, however, when we look at some other literature that, that is present, not necessarily by Orientalists, but by scholars, and academic uh, researchers and professors in the um, in the academic world today. Unfortunately, when they come to analyze, for example, Imam Ali alayhi salam, the viewpoint is through an academic lens. Mm. So for example, one academic here in the United Kingdom, quite, quite a known, known professor, came forward and said, Ali ibn Abi Talib was not a good leader. Mm. He's a failed leader. Mm. Why? Because in his watch, four years and nine months, there were three civil wars. Mm. Safin, Jamal, Safin, and Nahrawan. Mm. Whereas in the watch of the other Khulafa, there wasn't mm. as such, for example. And so he wasn't able, but that's a very narrow, very superficial look at the what life of Ali, the alayhi salam, mm. because he was a man of justice. Mm. He would not be f feeding people and giving them what they wanted. Mm. He stood for principles. He mm. was a man driven by principles. He was a godly individual. Mm. But of course, sometimes in academia, they look at only certain angles mm. with what evidence exists today. And I'd like to draw this point here, um, and that is encourage our dear brothers and sisters to get into academic circles, to do research based on uh, Shia literature, and to present the correct image of the Ahl al-Bayt in these universities and colleges and these setups. Mm. It's so important that we have a voice out there, especially scholars who have been to Hausa, established in the seminary, to have uh, academic qualifications, the masters and the PhDs and so on and so forth, mm. to be out there, not to allow this literature to continuously poison the minds. Mm. Do we have any more examples uh, of Fatima uh, Zahra al in academic literature that you wanted to share with us? Well, yes, we have examples, unfortunately, that exist in literature of, for example, um, uh, a lady by the name of um, Vaglieri in a very uh, well-known publication, Encyclopedia of Islam, uh, Volume 2, uh, in page 80, 841 to 50. This is a very famous and well-referenced book, if I'm It's a mistaken, very right? famous book, um, very well-referenced in academic literature. Mm. Uh, this individual, uh, she talks about the title Abu Turab. So she writes, the name Abu Turab, the man of dust, given to Ali, has, among other explanation, one connecting it with the disputes between Ali and Fatima. Instead of answering his wife in anger, Ali would go out of the house and put dust on his head. Muhammad, seeing him do this, gave him the famous nickname. Hmm. So this is actually in narration, uh, in reference to a numerous number of narrations that exist in the so-called Sahih books. Hmm. So in Sahih Bukhari, book 78, hadith number 228, mm. we are told that Sahal ibn Sa'ad uh, narrates that the most beloved name to Ali was Abu Turab. 
and he used to be pleased when uh, called when we called him by it. Of course, Sahel ibn Sa'ad was a companion of Rasulullah. He was uh, amongst the ones who saw uh, the caravan of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and Sayyidah mm -hmm. Zainab and then helped Imam Zain al-Abideen. He then says, for none named him Abu Turab but the Prophet. Mm -hmm. Once, he says, Ali got angry with his wife Fatima mm -hmm. and went out of the house and slept near a wall in the mosque. The Prophet ﷺ came searching for him and someone said, he is there lying near the wall. The Prophet came to him and said, where is Ali? And he found him that he was covered with dust. The Prophet started removing the dust from his back saying, Qum Aba Turab, hmm. get up Aba Turab. And what is interesting is that Muawiyah, one of the arch enemies of Amir al-Mu'mineen, used to name him Abu Turab. So he would say to, for example, uh, individuals, why don't you uh, curse? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was the father of Umar ibn Sa'ad, companion of the Holy Prophet, would refuse cursing Amir al Mu'mini. But Muawiyah would say to him, why don't you curse Abu Turab? Mm. Because he thought Abu Turab, because of course it was Bani Umayyah who fabricated these narrations. Mm. So he would think that Abu Turab was a title that was given to Imam Ali because he would be angry with Sayyidah Fatima, leave the house mm. and he would be covered in soil and dust. Mm. Abu Turab means the father of soil. And so the Prophet would be removing it. Mm. And so he would label him as such thinking is derogatory. Mm. Whereas in our traditions, Abu Turab was one of the most beloved titles to Imam Ali because mm. it was given to him by the Prophet. And it wasn't in times where he got angry with Sayyidah Fatima because he never got angry with Sayyidah Fatima. Mm. It was at times where, for example, uh, some occasion says it was in the battle where he was sleeping under a tree next to him with Ammar bin Yasir and soil came on his face and the Prophet came looking for him and wiped his face away from the soil and said, Qum Aba Turab. Mm. So interestingly, Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas, what they used to do is take a title and fabricate a story about it. Mm. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's not one or two. Numerous traditions exist in this particular regard. I'll just quote to you another one uh, that, is, that is unfortunately present in, in other works uh, of, of, um, of literature, of hadith, that um, Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam complains to Rasulullah. Mm. This is in Sahih Muslim that complains to Rasulullah that, you know, Ali, we had an argument. Mm. And so he stormed out of the house. Mm. And the Prophet comes to Imam Ali and says to him, why, what happened? Let me hold your hand and take you back home. Mm. And so I can reconcile between you and your wife, Fatima. Mm. And uh, eventually uh, he does so and, and seeks to bring. Th so unfortunately, when we look at this literature that exists, what kind of image is it being presenting? Is it presenting to Muslims and non-Muslims about the greatest lady in our view, created by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, mm. who is created not only, uh, you know, she was created from the fruits of Jannah. Mm. You know, she's the best in terms of uh, the choicest woman of 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 the world. Mm. Um, Sayyidah Tunisa al Alameen, the one who brings the light of of Imam and prophethood. Sadly, these do exist and we completely reject them. Mm. Uh, so, Sheikh, you mentioned uh, how some uh, non-Muslim sources look at Sayyidah Fatima and also some uh, sources that are outside of the school of Ahlul Bayt and, and how um, various uh, factions sought to fabricate uh, and uh, defame uh, the character, uh, fabricate narrations to defame the character of Sayyidah Fatima. How have uh, the school of Ahlul Bayt responded to these kind of like uh, allegations? Yeah. So the school of Ahl al-Bayt for 1400 years have been the voice and the defense of Ali Muhammad mm. sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. You see, there is one thing claiming love of Ali Muhammad and another actually demonstrating it through works, through statements, through, through speech, through action. Throughout 1400 years, there is no one or group of people who have defended the Prophet and his family like the Shia have mm. in every aspect whether it's these malicious attacks orchestrated by these individuals mm. or whether it is commemorating their dates their martyrdoms their wiladats their legacies writing about their lives learning mm. from their lives and applying it to ours when i look at for example muslim muslim ahmed ibn hanbal i find a narration that says that the distraught fatima wept in protest at the time of marriage to imam ali because of poverty. Mm. This is in Musnad Ahmed ibn Hanbal, mm. a very well recognized source, and uh, so on. 
in volume four of uh, Bukhari Sahih, Fatima Salamullah Alayha in that tradition complains to the Prophet that Ali wants to marry the daughter of Abu Jahl. Mm. And the Prophet said, by Allah, the daughter of the Prophet marries a daughter of enemy of God. They don't go hand in hand. That cannot happen. And so he goes and he says to Imam Ali, according to Bukhari, which many Muslims sadly consider today to be sahih or completely authentic, that he went and said to Imam Ali, either my daughter or the daughter of Abu Jahl. Mm. And so on. So how have the school of Ahlul Bayt responded? It's all well and good saying, yes, we reject it. It's not acceptable. It's not something we agree on, but we have to show evidence. We have to show proof and we are clear in our proof. Number one, the way we categorically reject any form of disrespect, dishonoring, and something which uh, puts in question the isma, the error-free, sinless nature of Sayyidah Fatima and the Ahl al-Bayt and the Holy Prophet and all the Prophets. And notice I did not use infallibility mm. because infallibility is a term that is not in accordance with our understanding of isma. Mm. Infallibility means unable to err, mm. whereas they were able to make mistakes, but they never did not even think about it. Mm. Error-free sinlessness is mm. better. So. Ayatul Tatir, 3333, in accordance with Muslim, Sunni, and Shia, whether they believe that the women, uh, the w wives of the Prophet are included or not, of course we have evidence that they're not included. Clear evidence from the Quran that the wives of the Prophet disobeyed him and committed sins in chapter 66 of the Quran, whereas 3333 says, Surely, verily, Allah wants to protect you, O Ahl al Bayt from all the kind of vices and impurities and thoroughly cleanse you a thorough purification. Notice I said protect you, not remove from you, which many of the translations of the Quran sadly have. Mm. The remove for you means that they already had mm. and then Allah removed it from them. Mm. We believe that they were born sinless and error free. So Ayat al tatir definitely includes Fatima. How can we accept Fatima and Ali, and of course, definitely includes Amir al-Mu'mineen. How can we ever accept that Sayyida Fatima and Amir al-Mu'mineen argued with each other, were angry with each other, disputed with each other, and had fights, whereas the Quran says they were error-free and sinless. Mm. Fighting and disagreements are all vices, mm. things which people today may be able to stay away from mm. in their marital lives, whereas we expect to somehow accept that Sayyidah Fatima and Imam Ali had this going on? Mm. Unacceptable. Secondly, Hadith al-Thaqalain, that the Holy Prophet in a, a chain of narrations which is as sound as the Quran, according to our ulama. You know, the Quran is so authentic, Hadith al-Thaqalain is as authentic. Mm. As authentic as the Quran. Mm. There is no doubt about it. Mm. It's so sound, so mutawatir, so strong. Inni tarikum fikum. I leave for you two weighty things. Kitab Allahi wa atrati ahla bayti. Ma anta masaktum bihima lan tadallu ba'di abada. I leave for you two weighty things. Uh, the book of Allah and my ahl bayt. Once you hold on to them, you will never go astray. Now, if, and we know that the ahl bayt include uh, of Sayyidah Fatima and Imam Ali. This means that they're on par with the Quran. The Quran clearly comes forward and talks about good marital relationship that you should treat your husbands and wives with respect and honor right you you should not exercise this kind of uh, uh, disrespect both physical or verbal so if they are empowered the quran how do we explain this kind of behavior it cannot be explained because they are the walking qurans mm. they demonstrated the quran in their lives in the life of imam ali السلام, that's the third proof he's the one and, and the life of Sayyidah Fatima, you see that their lives in authentic, uh, reliable traditions, they did not exhibit such a thing whatsoever. And Imam Ali Salam praises his wife, mm. and Sayyidah Fatima praises her husband. We said in the previous episode that Imam Ali Salam, when he was taking the will, Sayyidah Fatima said, I never upset you, mm. I never angered you. Mm. How could she say such a thing like this? And these narrations says that they were being uh, somehow uh, angry with the each other. The story is very out of their character. Yeah. I need to mention this very important point. Some people might say, okay, what is your fourth response? As mm. a school of Ahlul Bayt, we mentioned Quran, we mentioned Hadith, we mentioned the life of these two whole individuals. But we believe the fourth response is very important. We have to study why such narrations exist. Mm. The motives behind them. Why do they fabricate Tradition saying Ali and Fatima fought each other. Mm. The reason is because we have reliable traditions in the books of 
Shia and Sunni literature that talk about whoever angers Fatima angers Allah mm. isn't that found mm. in Sahih Bukhari and other traditions so Fatima is part of me whoever troubles her troubles me and whoever does so of course angers Allah subhanahu mm. ta'ala so when I was looking at hadith literature I found that unfortunately a lot of them outside the school of Ahlul Bayt used to quote this hadith of the Prophet after describing that Imam Ali angered mm. Fatima so they want to put two and two together. Mm. They want to attack Ali mm. by attacking Fatima. Mm. So they want to say, see, Ali angered Fatima. If the first Khalifa Abu Bakr angered Fatima, that's okay. Because they both angered Fatima. Mm. So don't be so hard on the first Khalifa. Mm. If you use this to say that she was angry with the first Khalifa because he took her right away, so did Ali, they said. Mm. So they had to fabricate something to justify the actions of others. Mm. This is why these particular traditions and fabrications are there to try and somehow legitimize the, um, sadly, the, the wrongs mm. that Sayyidina Fatima sallallahu alayha mm. faced in her life. I think it's very interesting um, how so many people over the course of history have felt threatened by uh, not just uh, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam as a person, but her legacy and generally the leg legacy of the Ahl Bayt alayhi salam. Um, we've spoken about uh, all these uh, uh, various unfortunate uh, narrations concerning uh, and, fabrication and, and fabricated uh, lies against uh, uh, this great lady. Uh, in the last few minutes that we have, what can we do uh, mm -hmm. as followers of Fatima, as people who claim to, to, to love Fatima and serve Fatima, what can we do in this day and age uh, to not just tackle these misconceptions, uh, and ensure um, that she, uh, her, her legacy is cemented in academic and study circles, but also just generally uh, show Fatima to the wider society, the wider world. لو علم الناس محاسن أمورنا لتبعونا إمام الرضا صلى الله عليه mentions this famous tradition that if people knew about us, they would follow us. But of course, knew about us in the right way, in the sense that the correct knowledge should reach them. Mm. Today, Alhamdulillah, we have organizations like who is Hussein for mm. example we need who is Fatima mm. we need to have a literature that is presented to the non-muslim world mm. about the legacy of Sayyidat Nisa Fatima mm. from Shia traditions mm. stories written plays mm. movies in the m way that our maraja have accepted mm. the way that our maraja have allowed so that we are not keeping Sayyida Fatima in our own mosques and centers. We are sharing her amazing lessons and teachings to the outside world. Mm. How many people, even in the Muslim Ummah, have heard of the sermon of Sayyida Fatima mm. and the rich lessons that exist within it? If today we hold a Muslim who is a non-Shia and say to him, tell me, can you speak for five minutes about Fatima to Zahra? Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Mm. Why is it that today the number one name given to females mm. around the world in the Muslim countries, as far as Muslim females, is not Fatima? Mm. She comes way down. Mm. We haven't necessarily presented her teachings in the way that we should do or invested as much as we can, not only in the academic circles, mm. but in every other way possible. Mm. We should have seminars and conferences and literature where we invite those of our brothers school of thought who are sympathetic and lovers of Ahl al-Bayt to talk about the greatness of this holy lady. Mm. We should have apps, we should have websites, we should have webinars, use technology, we should have these vlogs and small clips that should go viral, we should have podcasts as much as we can to illustrate what she means. Mm. And just like how the world today knows who Gandhi is, mm. It's like how the world today knows who Nelson Mandela is, mm. Mother Teresa. I'm pretty sure that these names are much more known than Sayyidah Fatima, mm. unfortunately. Mm. We need to wake up mm. and spread the light of Fatima mm. as much as we can. Mm. And we are inspired by her life and we have a responsibility mm. to do so. I think just leading on from that uh, conclusion, uh, when you mentioned some names like Mother Teresa, and I, I think if you step outside the Muslim community, you see uh, female figures uh, who we um, uh, really 
you know, who are inspirations for us as well, like, for example, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, and I feel that so many people outside of our own communities would benefit from a Lady Fatima if they just knew about her and what she stood for and what she can and, and how she can inspire them. Especially if you bring about this whole comparison or bring discussion of Mary and Fatima. Mm. There are there is one or two books I saw from non-Muslims that are bringing these two, how they two are important, one in Christianity and one in mm. uh, Shia Islam. But what is interesting is that we can also speak about the greatness of Maryam mm. and how she means so much to us mm. as well. So bringing these two characters together will help also in interfaith programs mm. as well. Mm. We can utilize these personalities mm. in getting closer and strengthening community relations. Mm. Thank you so much. You are watching this show where we are uh, remembering the legacy of Fatima Zahra Islam, and we discussed the various injustices that exist uh, against uh, this uh, wonderful role model now in the centuries after her death and we hope that inshallah together uh, each of us and we hope that you at home as well are inspired uh, to try your best to, to push forward uh, and uh, spread the legacy of Fatima Zahra Islam in the wider world whichever way you can inshallah we'll be back in the next episode please join us then Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh